Dr. Brain. If you're new to the show, we're going to be taking all of your nutritional questions. If you've got them, our topic today is detoxification from gluten. So if you've got specific gluten detox questions you'd like to get answered, I'm going to do my best to prioritize those questions first. All you have to do is type in your question in the chat box. And again, if you're new, make sure you come also visit us at glutenfreesociety.org and uh, sign up there for our free newsletter. We'll send you a bunch of free diet lifestyle information on how to conquer autoimmunity in your life. So thanks again and welcome to the show. So let's dive into your questions. Uh, Marianne says, Dr. Osborne, I was eating here and there. I was eating gluten here and there and my left knee got very swollen and with a lot of pain. Then I decided to do a water fast. Um, can I still eat Ezekiel bread is the question, basically. Um, and this comes up a lot in people following a gluten-free diet because there's a lot of, I'll just say a lot of rhetoric websites that claim that because it's an ancient grain that it is safe for people with gluten sensitivity. And the reality is Ezekiel bread has gluten in it. So if you are gluten sensitive, eating Ezekiel bread is a bad idea. Eating any kind of grain really is a bad idea. So keep that in mind just because it's an ancient grain doesn't mean it's gluten free. And again, gluten uh, for many of you is the enemy. Is ghee okay? So Pam says, um, is ghee okay? Lactose, casein, gluten free. I see no mention of it. I am coconut. So ghee, where ghee can be problematic, and this is just from my practice experience, Pam is if a person is also reacting to dairy. Now, what we generally tend to do in people who are gluten sensitive initially is we take them dairy free for the first six months. And why we're doing that is because we're trying to remove dairy because there's a protein in dairy called casein that can look like gluten. And so if a person's immune system is aggressively attacking gluten when they're being exposed, a lot of times that translates into dairy reactivity as well. And so ghee, although has less casein in it, is not 100% casein free. So it's going to be one of those things I'm going to caution against, especially if you're new to the diet. Now, when you get six months in, you've been grain free for six months and you're looking to consider adding dairy back into the diet, you should check out our videos on dairy to do this in the right way because there's a wrong and a right way to add try to add dairy back in and you just don't want to do it the wrong way because it could create a lot of problems for you so we'll put a link to that video up for you as well uh, so cedric says does doesn't zeolite also remove glyphosate uh, and so there's, yes, there's some evidence that shows that zeolite is a good binder. Zeolite's really great at it. It's an adsorbent and it binds a lot of toxins. Um, zeolite does. It's got, it's actually got a greater surface area than carbon and works really well for it. There's a, there are a lot of instances where we use zeolite. I actually prefer combining, um, carbon uh, with zeolite, uh, for many of, of these types of situations, but yes, it can remove and help remove glyphosate. Stephanie's asking, I did a vitamin C flush. It only took 45 minutes. Is that good? So we're talking about vitamin C flushing to help detox from gluten exposure. And if it only took you 45 minutes, it's not bad. I mean, probably Stephanie, your body's decently saturated with vitamin C if it only took you 45 minutes. It's, so it's not, it's not bad. Now, if it's taken you four, five, six plus hours to do vitamin C flush, you might want to consider repeating that flush in another three or four weeks. It, it generally, for the average person to do a complete vitamin C flush, should take around 20 to 30 grams. And so that's generally, that means you're going to have a complete flush within about two hours, usually closer to an hour and a half. But if it took you 45 minutes, it's perfectly fine. What if I didn't figure out until two days later that I got glutened and I can hardly walk? Um, same thing. You, you can still do a flush. Again, a lot of people, when they get gluten exposure, because the bowel transit time can be upwards of two and a half days, you, you can, even if you don't find out until two days later, you can still do a flush. You can still take carbon uh, and zeolite. Um, 
those things still work. You can also fast uh, for quicker recovery as well. So the same strategies would apply. The, the key is that you recognize that you've got gluten and that you deal with it appropriately and that you learn from the mistake and that you don't repeat the mistake in the future. What do you think about magnesium flush with vitamin C? Magnesium increase, increases. You could do magnesium, but you know, super high doses of magnesium like that to flush out the bowel generally um, can make a person really groggy and tired, which is one reason why I don't really recommend magnesium as the flushing agent versus vitamin C where vitamin C generally a lot of times will energize an individual, make them feel better quickly. Magnesium again, because it's a natural must relax, relaxer can make a person feel groggy. So not, not the best tool in my opinion for a, for a, a bowel flush. I love, I love a lot of these comments. No grain, no pain saved my life. Reading it now again, such, uh, such good news. Um, quinoa, does it have the same protein as gluten? It's quinoa is one of those that can mimic gluten. There are a couple different proteins in quinoa that have been studied that have molecular mimicry with, with gluten protein. So we've got a good article on that. If you'd like to read it, we can put a link up as well to that article. And, um, if you want to check that out. Maltodextrin made from corn, so that should be avoided, right? People in health food stores have told me it's gluten-free. Yeah, we don't recommend maltodextrin. Now, there are different kinds, Elaine. There are different kinds of maltodextrin. You can have corn or wheat-based maltodextrin, but you could also have potato or tapioca-based maltodextrin. So read your labels carefully and look for the source or the origin of the maltodextrin being used. And if it's grain free and you're gluten sensitive, then you, you may still be able to have it. Now, all that being said, maltodextrin, um, not the healthiest thing in the world to, to use in large quantities. So it's something I would encourage you to try to want to avoid for the most part anyway. Okay. Let's see here. If you use aloe, does it block absorption of nutrients? No, aloe does not block absorption of nutrients. Dr. Ross, and the reason the question is being asked is because aloe is one of the, um, one of the herbal agents that we recommend to coat and line and the, to coat and soothe the lining of the GI tract. If you've been gluten to just kind of lay down a layer of protection, but it will not cause malabsorption. Let's see. Mary says, Dr. Osborne, having such problems giving up gluten, even though it makes my body ache, causes fatigue, and makes me feel like I weigh a ton when I lift my feet uh, in feet cramps. I wish I had more willpower, but I don't. It's worse than being addicted to drugs. Is there anything you could recommend? Yeah, that's a tough situation. Mary, you're probably having drug-like withdrawals from gluten Gluten, when it's broken down, forms a, a subprotein called exorphin that mimics morphine. So in a subset of people going gluten-free, they actually feel like they're going through drug withdrawal. And so they have those types of symptoms, and that may be you. Um, vitamin C at higher doses along with niacin can both be helpful at reducing that. Those types of symptoms can be helpful in supporting you to kick it better. Marion, you may also consider that you might have a yeast overgrowth in your GI tract. This is one of the most common things that we see when people are craving sugar, craving carbohydrates, really having a hard time kicking gluten out of the diet. It's because they have yeast overgrowing in their GI tract and that is driving, um, it's driving the decision making from the gut and not from the brain. So no matter how much willpower you have, it's just a harder thing to accomplish. And in that situation, you may consider uh, three supplements to support you. One, I would consider a probiotic with S. Bilardi in it. We have something called biotic defense with S. Bilardi. Um, what S. Bilardi does is it creates a competition factor for yeast. So it, it basically competes with yeast overgrowth and takes away the resources from the yeast so that it makes it harder for the yeast to grow out of control. Number two, 
um, you might consider something called caprylic acid. Caprylic acid is a natural substance that has anti-yeast properties. It's actually been shown to poke little holes in the cell membrane and the walls of, of yeast. And so it can make it harder for them to thrive and survive. The other thing you might consider are some other herbal antifungals. We, we actually have a formula called Yeast Shield that works really well in these types of situations. So those are things you might also consider if you're really, really struggling and, you're, and, you, and you feel like you're addicted uh, to the gluten. Lynn asks, I have your detox C capsules. Can I crush them and use it for the vitamin C flush? You could, I just don't recommend it. Um, I mean, you certainly could try. The, the, the coating on the detox C is des it's designed to preserve and protect the vitamin C inside. So you, you know, it's, it's not as ideal as if you use the powder, but you, you certainly could give it a go. If you have a pestle and you want to grind those things down, you, you can. Do we take the aloe before we eat? Answer, yes, um, you do. You take it before you eat. So if gluten, we can do a, a C flush other than in the morning? Yes. Yeah, you can do a C flush at any time of the day. It's ideally performed on an empty stomach. But, um, you know, again, if you got gluten, you want to get it, you want to empty your bowels as soon as you possibly can. So, you know, that's the whole premise of it is you're trying to empty your bowel of any gluten exposure that you got. So, yes, you can do it even though you're not fasted. Um, question on, I have a sibling with celiac disease. So assuming gluten intolerance, a safe bet for myself, but I haven't been diagnosed with celiac disease. Thank you for the additional testing. If, as I have three autoimmune issues, does intrinsic, I, 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 I'm not sure I understand. Does IF test seem reasonable? If you're talking about intrinsic factor, do you have antibodies to intrinsic factor? It, it's reasonable, but one of the problems with you know, with people that are reacting to gluten is that their immune systems are, are actually being suppressed. And so their overall antibody production is suppressed. And so doing antibody tests may come back false negative. And that's where, you know, the test can be done. It's, it is reasonable to suspect and to do that, but it's also, you know, grain of, uh, of caution there that, that you could get a false negative on that test if you have total antibody suppression. So ask your doctor simultaneously to measure your total antibody levels as well. So if they're doing, for example, an IgG and IgA intrinsic factor antibody test, make sure they're also measuring your total IgG and your total IgA because if you're deficient in those two, again, you could get a false negative. Jessica's asking, what is the dosage of mycobinder and how long do I need to fast after being gluten? So fasting is just a strategy uh, to give your gut a rest. A day or two is perfectly fine for the fasting component. Um, as far as the dosage of mycobinder, two capsules three times a day would be where I would, I would start a person. It's very difficult for me to get my maintenance calorie count without grains, pseudo grains, legumes, dairy products, and carbohydrates in general. That's a tough question to answer because you got a lot of things that you're not eating. It almost, in a sense, sounds like you might be, you know, consuming close to a carnivore diet. There's not a lot of calories some fruits and you could get some of your calories and specifically some of your carbohydrates up by eating, you know, potentially more fruit. But if you're trying to hit 2,500 calories and you're cutting out grains, through grain legumes, dairy, then that means you've got to go to, um, nut things like nuts that are generally high in calories that, um, will provide you with a, a valid source of protein and fat. You've got to go to meats, any variety of those. Um, potentially increasing your, your quantity, you know, a good, a good size steak, for example, is, you know, north of 400 calories. Um, and the fat in it is very rich in caloric. You might look at things like avocado as a source of calories. You might look at adding, you know, some avocado oil, coconut oil, or even, um, olive oil 
um, to like a salad if you're doing any kind of vegetables. Like one of the types of salads that I like to do, this is for those of you who aren't reactive to nightshades, is you just take um, cucumbers and skin them and cut them up with some um, small cherry tomatoes and, and um, you can add a little bit of vinegar um, to your taste or flavor, but then douse it with some good oil. And that's a good source of calories to, to help you hit that 2,500. But, you know, maybe fill up too. a good thing to do would be because you're doing so much restriction, is that necessary? And that's you know, big questions. I, I would say if you're gluten sensitive, yes, grains and pseudo grains, definitely a good idea to keep them out. But the other things you're avoiding, you may not have to avoid them hundred percent. So I would just, again, I would just consider getting some food sensitivity testing done as well to give you better clarity, potentially expand your diet. My nutritional test shows magnesium is in the gutter. Every time I reintroduce salad and veggies into the diet, I get nauseous and backed up. How can I build up my magnesium? Well, if you're not able to do it through food, Filene, you, you're going to want to consider supplementation. Um, you know, there are, there are people that don't do well with heavy quantities of vegetables. And uh, this, this is one of the reasons why the carnivore diet has become wildly popular of late. And so, um, you know, if your magnesium is low, the best place to get magnesium is, you know, outside of, outside of vegetables is, you know, you can get some good magnesium in organ meat. And I don't know if you're incorporating any of that in your diet, but beyond that, I would, I would encourage you to look at supplementation as an option. I recently had a gliadin panel done, alpha, beta, gliadin, IgG, gamma, gliadin, IgG, gluteomorphin, IgA, and uh, protonorphin, IgG were high. I have a celiac and alpha, gliadin, IgG, and IgA uh, were in control. It's one of the problems with antibody testing is you can have gluten sensitivity and some of the antibodies are coming back normal. Some of the antibodies are coming back abnormal. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm not a fan of of antibody testing as a whole because you can react to gluten beyond antibody reactions or responses there's there's two arms of the immune system two major arms rather one is your innate immune system the other is your humoral immune system your humoral immune system is the one responsible for producing antibodies your innate immune system generally is going to uh, create inflammatory chemicals when exposed and and so a lot of this antibody testing that doctors do on people with with the suspicion of gluten, don't pick up innate immune system reactions. So you can miss a lot or you can have a normal response in that regard. And that's probably why you have those mixed results. Is a high level of IgG antibodies to an egg a true indicator of sensitivity to the egg, even though I feel phenomenal after eating eggs? No, it's not because it depends on the type of IgG antibody testing you had done. So there's two kinds of, well, there's more than two, but there's, there's protective antibodies and then there are antibodies that can hurt you. And so if your IgG test is not differentiating protective from harmful antibodies, then you can get a false positive. And, and this is one of the common problems, Philip, with a, a lot of these um, online testing companies that measure IgG is you get a ton of false positive. And so you get this laundry list of foods that you should be avoiding. And a lot of them you're not actually reacting to. You, you, you have protective antibodies for those things. And so they're not a problem. So if the lab you are using didn't differentiate protective from harmful antibodies, then it's very possible you're not reacting to eggs at all. It's one of the reasons why we actually offer testing online to people because we, we differentiate protective from non-protective antibodies so that you don't get this litany of false positives on your results. What's your opinion of allulose? I don't like it. Um, a lot of people are pushing this stuff right now. Most of the, well, honestly, I don't like it. That Maybe that's strong, but most of the allulose products on the market right now are corn derivative and that's why i don't like it you know i don't like using corn derivative so um, from that perspective i'm not a fan of allulose now if you've got allulose that's derived from something else uh, like prunes as an example that would be a better alternative but this would be one of the questions you have to ask the company you're buying it from
due to recent stresses, I lost way too much weight. I'm at 89 pounds and I'm 5'3". Yep, you're definitely underweight. Um, I look like a skeleton. How can I get enough calories to put the weight back on? Um, well, not to keep in mind that 3,500 calories is equal to one pound. That means you have to consume in excess of 3,500 calories to put one pound back on. And so generally, you're not going to do that today or tomorrow. So the way you try to do that is incorporate or increase your caloric load. And that, I mean, it's really, I say it's that simple, but um, you've got to increase your, your intake of food to the tune of, you know, an excessive 3,500 calories per week. So if you eat an extra 500 calories a day over seven days, it's going to approximately give you an extra pound a week. And so you may be able to get that weight back on you over the course of, you know, the next four to six months, um, would be the, would be the most, the simplest way to put it. But, you, you know, again, one of the things I've, I've talked about this in past shows, you've got to count how many calories you, you need. And there are BMR calculators that you can look up online. These BMR calculators will help give you an idea of, you know, how much calories you should be eating per day to get to your health goal. And so you really want to, you want to dive into what that number might look like as far as which foods to eat. It depends. What are you allergic to? What are you not allergic to? What foods are high nutrient density, high calories, um, that can add to that are healthy, right? And I, cause some doctors will say, well, just drink, you know, just drink, drink protein shakes that are full of corn sugar or eat ice cream and you'll put the weight back on. And that's a bad idea because you don't want to eat inflammatory foods in an effort to try to restore your health. So you know, you've got to choose from real foods and there's a variety. There are 400 common foods that you could eat, you know, that we sell here in the U S that, um, you know, and in most industrial industrial places in the world that you have to pick from. But again, a big part of that just depends on if you're allergic to certain things or not. So you have to parse that, that part out because I would say, depending on what kind of stress you suffered, you know, if you went from 110 to 89 over stress, I would doubt it was just like emotional stress that caused that unless you were just self-starving. But um, there may be something else going on that's affecting your absorption and digestion. And so it's probably a good idea you follow up with a good doctor and get some of that stuff checked out as well. Dr. Rose, is it a good idea to take GI Soothe or GI Shield for heartburn? Uh, you can. You can. A lot, of, a lot of people find it to be very soothing in that regard as far as dosage. You know, GI Soothe dosing is, is two caps every three hours or so of the waking day. So you get up to seven, eight capsules of that a day uh, to coat your, your, your stomach. And the same thing with GI Shield, although it's a powder, you would do a scoop a couple of times a day to, um, to get that coating. Let's see here. Just want to say thank you. Four months into No Grain, No Pain, have lost 30 pounds. Got allergy and nutrient testing done. Was quite surprised. May God continue to bless this work you are doing. Well, thanks for that. I'm glad you're doing so much better. Keep up the good work yourself. Gluten-free but not carb-free. Experiencing nighttime knee pain. Once out of bed, I feel fine. Are the extra carbs consuming over the winter a common source of candied overgrowth or oxalates? Speculatively, maybe. You know, you'd have to get tested to to determine that you can ask your local doc to do a 24 hour urine oxalate test and see what comes up. You can also ask for a yeast culture in your bowel to see what comes back. But, um, look, if the knee feels fine when you're out of bed and, it, and it's hurting at night, it may be the positioning of your, of the way that you're sleeping. It may be that you are, um, sleeping at odds with what your knee needs. It could be that you have tight hamstring or tight calf or gastroc muscles. I mean, there, there's a lot there that could be kind of looked at and unpacked. So I, I would say you need to probably look into all of those things. Um, will you be offering a different food allergy? To, we already do. So JJ, if you if we can put a, our link up to our food sensitivity testing for JJ, um, so she can check that out. To support liver detox pathways, what do you recommend? Um, Melanie, we have something called ultra liver detox for that specifically. It supports uh, both phase one and two and three 
uh, pathways in the liver for detoxification. So it's called ultra liver detox. I have Hashimoto's and low thyroid. Next time I get blood work for TSH, T3, T4, and reverse T3, will my results show me whether or not I should take tyrosine? No, your results won't show you whether or not you should take tyrosine because none of those things that you just discussed being measured are tyrosine. You, you need to get your tyrosine measured, Debbie. That, that would be the way to understand whether or not taking tyrosine might be beneficial or, or, or necessary. I mean, you could take tyrosine regardless, I mean, and just support your thyroid function. Um, keep in mind that when sometimes when people take too much tyrosine, it can cause a little bit of heightened energy and anxiety. So just be aware of that as a potential possibility. Usually tyrosine is, is, is fairly benign at doses, you know, a thousand or, or below milligrams. And so, um, but I've seen cases where people are on a thousand milligrams of tyrosine and it started to, to cause them to have anxiety. So just again, be aware of that as a potential. This is one of the reasons why I like, I like to test, right? Because then you don't have to guess. Is it okay to take thyroid vite? VIT from Bright Naturals. I, I don't comment on other companies' products, Mira. So is it okay? You know, maybe or maybe not. Without me seeing the label, seeing what's in it, um, seeing what fillers or other ingredients are in it, it's really just, you know, not fair for me to comment about another product that I'm not remotely familiar with. I don't understand why my hair falls out when I do exercise. You're probably not eating enough protein, Alina. Check your protein levels. If you're exercising aggressively, you should be getting a minimum of one and a half grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And if you're not hitting that, your body's going to compete. Your exercise is going to compete with your hair growth. Remember, hair is made from protein, and so too are your muscles. And you need that protein to repair your muscles after exercise. And so, again, if you're not getting enough, hair is going to take the back seat. And so it'll thin out and you'll lose it more aggressively. We also have a really good show on hair loss that you might want to check out see if there's some other potential issues that you're having in that regard. Do organic potato chips or organic popcorn contain gluten? I presume they cause leaky gut. Um, so do they contain gluten? Potato chips do not contain gluten unless they're cross-contaminated. So check the manufacturer of the product to, you know, to see whether or not they have a dedicated facility that's grain-free. Popcorn contains gluten because corn has gluten in it. Corn has a type of gluten in it called zane. If this is new to you and you've never heard this before, you need to go read No Grain, No Pain and check out some of my videos on corn gluten um, for more in-depth detail and analysis there. But I would, I would also argue eating potato chips isn't good for you, right? So if you're trying to get healthy, if you're struggling, you know, potato chips, not the best idea that, you know, I'm not trying to take away your potato chips, but you know, the reality is there's three rules to eating that, you know, I try to encourage people to abide by rule. Number one is you can't get healthy and you can't maintain your health eating food. That's not good for you. Right. I mean, simple rule and potato chips aren't good for you, no matter how you make them organic or how you fry them in different oils. Fried potato is not a healthy thing to consume on a regular basis. Um, number two, you, you listen to your body when you eat. So if your body, rejects a food. If you eat a food and your body says, I don't like this and gives you a set of symptoms and your body's right. Listen to your body and remove that food from your diet. And then number three, don't eat what you're allergic, sensitive, or intolerant to. So if you follow those three rules generally well, you'd be good. Can lipedema be caused by gluten? Yeah, I've seen a lot of cases of lipedema improve dramatically with, uh, with, with diet change, particularly going gluten-free. Cracked heels, is that a lack of B vitamins? I try to search on your site. As I've heard, you mentioned it before. Yeah, it can be, Gene. It can definitely be um, a B vitamin deficiency. It can be omega-3 deficiency. It can also be gluten damage. Um, we also see cracked heels happen in a lot of people that have yeast overgrowth. So, I mean, there's a, there are a number of things that it could be, but B vitamins is on that list for sure. Need mag oxide to have any bowel movement. 
high dose, even when I have a bowel movement, any food makes me very gassy and bubbly due to the mag oxide side effects. What can I do? Sharon, you need to get some testing done. Um, if eating any food creates that kind of situation and you're just not having bowel movements, you know, you should probably have a good assessment done of your microbiome, of your gut and of your pancreas and of your liver and gallbladder, because those are what we call digestive accessory organs. They help you digest your food. And if you're not digesting and your bowels not functioning effectively, that needs to be assessed. If you're not already gluten-free, a lot of people who are gluten sensitive suffer from constipation and need mag oxide as, as, a, as a means to have a bowel movement. So if you haven't looked at diet change, you might also just consider that as well. I encourage you to read No Grain, No Pain and follow the diet for 30 days and see what happens with your constipation if you haven't already. <clears throat> I'm eating a gluten-free diet, but my SGBT is high. What's the reason? I mean, there could be a lot of reasons your liver enzyme is elevated. You know, if you don't drink alcohol, uh, alcohol can do it. Mold and mycotoxin exposure can cause uh, liver struggles. Food allergies can cause liver struggles. Certain types of bacterial overgrowths. Um, certain bacteria produce these little toxic compounds called lipopolysaccharides or LPS for short. And these types of compounds can damage the liver. They're actually linked to fatty liver disease and liver enzyme elevation. So you might want to check those things out. Do you have any daily supplements, vitamins you recommend for everyone, even if you're not sick or symptomatic? I do. Um, so one, Melissa, we have we have uh, we recommend a multivitamin. We have two two formulas for that. We have one called Ultra Nutrients. The other is called Multi Nutrients. And the difference is Multi Nutrients has just got a higher quantity of B vitamins in it. So if you're one of those individuals that just need more B vitamins, it's a better choice for you. But um, but that's one. The other would be an omega omega fatty acid supplement. We have two. Um, we have one called Omega Max and we have another one called Ultra Omega. The difference between those two is that um, Ultra Omega is designed for people who struggle with fat absorption or don't have gallbladders. It actually has uh, lipase in it to help you digest it. So, you know, if you don't have a gallbladder or struggle with fat malabsorption, Ultra Omega would be a better choice. So those two things would be like staples the way I would see it for anyone, just trying to support their body's health and, and longevity. You know, some people also do really, really well with a probiotic. And so you might also consider probiotics as, a, as another option. Um, we have something called biotic, um, biotic uh, defense, which is a broad spectrum probiotic with a strong mixture of hearty strains of bifido and lactobacillus species. So it's a good maintenance type of probiotic if you're looking for something specific. So I, I, I had an acquired allergy to eggs. Um, is, it, is it safe for me to reintroduce eggs into the diet? once the gut has healed without testing. Well, if it's, if it's an acquired allergy and it's a delayed allergy, I would encourage you to test for it before reintroducing it because delayed allergies or delayed sensitivities, you know, they have a window of three weeks and you don't always feel them. You don't, you know, you don't always have this immediate acute symptom or side effect from, from the consumption of something you have a delayed response to. So testing would always be, in my opinion, a better way to be cautious about the reintroduction of something you've been historically reactive to. What's the most efficient way to test for yeast overgrowth? Um, so two ways, if you're talking about in the gut, one is through a culture. Cultures can be hard to grow. Um, so in, in the case of a culture, a yeast a gut cult culture, you need to make sure the lab is holding on to the specimen for at least two weeks, because if they only hold on to it for a few days, you, a lot of times you'll get a false negative on the culture. So they need to hold that culture longer. Number two is a microscopic evaluation where they actually under microscopy, look at the sample, the stool sample to identify 
yeast in the sample directly. So those are two things that, in my opinion, should both be done if you're trying to get an accurate assessment. What do you think about using taurine for regeneration and detoxification? I think taurine's great. I think bigger question is with any, and this is true of any detoxification program or protocol, is what are you detoxifying from? Because the answer to that question is, can taurine be used for detox? Yeah, it can. But should it be used in your particular situation is a whole nother question, you know, which, which merits more investigation. Uh, but it's a safe supplement to take and is a very little or low so side effect profile. So in, in that regard, it's, it's probably not going to hurt you, but it may not be the thing that's the most effective for you. And that's, that's the question mark. Limited funds with mold exposure, is it more beneficial to test person or home first? Mm. In my opinion, it's, it's best to test the person, Melissa. Now, now, there's a caveat to that because if you test positive for mycotoxin levels, high mycotoxin levels or high mycotoxin antibody levels or high um, mold allergy response, does that mean your house has mold? And the, and the answer is maybe. Um, depends. So if you go to work, let's say you go to a work environment and there's mold where you work. I see this all the time in schools where teachers are being exposed to mold because schools, um, you know, a lot of schools are old and the infrastructure is not being well maintained. And so there's no mold at their house, but they go to work for 10 hours a day and they're getting exposed at work. So this is where testing yourself can leave another question mark because if you come back positive, it doesn't mean that the mold is necessarily in your home. It, it means that it's coming from somewhere that you're ha spending a lot of time. And so that could be home, that could be work. And I've even seen cases where people had mold toxicity from their car. Um, where I live down in Houston, a lot of times there, there are floods that occur. And so, so on these car lots, you get cars that flood. Well, what do they do? They dry them out and then they sell them at auction. And then people end up buying moldy cars and don't even know it. I had a case uh, last year where a woman was, you know, she was a sales rep and she worked out of her car. So she was in her car most of the day. And what was happening is she was being mold poisoned as a result of her car. So long story short, to answer your question, I like to test the person first. Um, that's just my preference. So then if, one, if it, because if it's negative, we don't, we need to worry about the expense of testing home and work and cars, but if it's positive, now we have to start reverse engineering where we think it might be positive from. And that's where, you know, on a limited budget, it can start getting a little bit more expensive. Cause now you have, you have to always, I always say, start with testing your house once you know you have it. Okay. So if it's positive in your body, the place you probably spend the most time is your home. And so that would be the next most logical place to investigate or look for it. That hopefully that's helpful for you. Mold's rough. I, I've been through it myself. I lost a house to mold. And um, I certainly understand the, the constraints it can put on a person. What can I take for a diverticular flare? Well, number one, Sue, figure out why you're having diverticulitis. Um, because no amount of product that I can recommend that you take to support that is going to fix why the flares happen. So for a lot of people, the diverticular flares are their diets. They're eating, they're eating the wrong food. So keep that in mind. Consider food testing. Consider if you're not gluten-free, consider gluten sensitivity as a potential reason why you might be getting them. Um, as far as just like what can you do to support recovering once you have one, we have something called GI Shield. Uh, which would be what I would recommend in, in that type of situation. And that what that will do is it will just put a protective coat coating down to, to kind of help you over the hump. I have low elastase and must take Creon with my meals. Three years ago, I tested positive for gluten sensitivity and no longer have it. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think you can test positive for gluten sensitivity and then no longer have it because gluten sensitivity is genetic. If you have the gene markers for gluten predisposition, then you're going to react to gluten when you eat it. And it's not that low elastase from your pancreas caused the gluten sensitivity. It's that gluten sensitivity most likely caused pancreatic inflammation, suppressing your elastase production. So I think you have it backwards. I see this all the time in people. 
And so there's not an alternative to Creon per se, um, although I've seen people be able to get off of Creon when they maintained a solid gluten grain free diet and allowed their pancreas to heal. So I think you, again, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to go and reevaluate that. Um, go up just a little bit on the left. I've suffered with stomach pains and swollen joints for years. After finding your page last week, I've cut out gluten. Still having stomach pain and knee pains. Is this normal? Yeah, because you've been suffering for years. You're not going to just cut it out for a week and magically all of your symptoms subside. Um, I wish that they would have subsided in, in just a week, but that's not real typical. So it takes about three months for the gluten to get out of your system. And we have a really good video, Sarah, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, it's how long does gluten stay in your system is the title of that video. And it will help you understand kind of what's a better expectation for you as you embark on that diet change, um, what, you know, what you should kind of expect, because if you're not, if you're not getting better, you know, beyond that third month, you're probably missed. There are probably some other things that you're missing and that, and that video will help you kind of understand that too. Okay, um, go back down on the left. I like this. So Nancy says, my hair on the side of temples has increased since I stopped eating bread. I just gave up grain because it's all junk today. We're all having so many problems because of this and the pesticides. Thanks for sharing, Nancy. I'm glad your hair is coming back in. I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, osteoporosis with multiple spine fractures and diverticular disease. Any advice? Yeah, you need to get tested, Sue. I think you asked another question earlier, but, you know, Hashimoto's is autoimmune. Osteoporosis is autoimmune. Multiple spine fractures is definitely autoimmune because it's the osteoporosis that comes usually with the severity of osteoporosis that comes with actually having celiac disease which not only is an autoimmune response on the small intestine, but can transfer autoimmune response to the bone, but also it causes massive malabsorption leading to the inability to remineralize your bones. And so then you're predisposed to early fractures. You're probably gluten sensitive. I, 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 if you were the one with the pancreas issue and tested positive for gluten, and now you're not testing positive for gluten, I, again, I'd go back and say you probably are gluten sensitive in a very big way and you need to get that under control. Uh, but you know, you don't want to mess around with those diagnoses like that. Multiple spine fractures, especially if they persist and, you know, continue to happen, you could wind up in bed. You could wind up not functional because of spine fractures like that. So, um, because the spine is generally extremely, extremely dense. And so you just generally, you won't see spine fractures like that unless somebody's pretty advanced. So you need to get, you need to get in to see an expert as soon as, soon as possible. And I don't mean like an endocrinologist type of expert or a, or a GI, I, GI doctor type of expert. I mean a functional expert, somebody who understands functional care and can really run the right kinds of tests to give you specific guided advice. How long should one, I think I answered that earlier, but how long should one fast when getting glutened? One to two days is ample, is adequate. What is your opinion on using um, microdosing lithium orotate or using medicinal mushrooms as immunomodulators to cure autoimmune disease? They don't cure autoimmune disease. They suppress the immune system. Um, they suppress it down so that autoimmune symptoms are less aggressive, but they don't cure it. Um, autoimmune disease has triggers. And if you don't know what those triggers are, then you can do all the immunomodulator things you want to do. Um, but at the end of the day, but nobody develops autoimmune disease because they have a mushroom deficiency or, um, you know, now lithium is a different matter because lithium is a mineral and lithium is, is actually um, an important mineral in that regard. So to me, if you're going to do lithium supplementation, you should have your lithium levels checked, which you can do. And that's, it's not hard to do, but 
But as far as the mushrooms are concerned, nobody to ever develop autoimmune disease because they were mushroom deficient. And that's not to say you can't use them. That's not to say they can't be helpful. Right? As opposed to medicate the what? You need to you need to get the right testing done to find the triggers. Remember, there's four triggers for autoimmune disease, biochemically speaking. Food is a trigger, chemical exposure is a trigger, microbial imbalance is a trigger, and nutritional deficiencies are a trigger. What kind of vitamin C for the flush? Don's asking. So we, we use something, Don, called Detox C, and I'll put a link up below in the feed for you. I test high for gliadin still, despite having been gluten-free for almost two years. I do see an FMD, but he isn't sure why. Is there something else that can cause high gliadin? There are things that have the potential to mimic it. Probably one of the most common summer would be yeast overgrowth. Yeast produce a protein that look like alpha gliadin. So it's possible that you're, you're still having a reaction to to what looks like gluten if you do have a yeast overgrowth. So you might ask your doc to measure, do a culture and, and microscopic or microscopic eval um, for yeast overgrowth in your GI tract to see if that's happening. Uh, the other thing I've seen do that is when somebody's living in mold um, specifically. So, you know, if you, if you suspect, you know, mold in your home or mold in your workplace, you might want to consider, you know, getting measured or getting tested for those as well. I've eliminated so much from my diet, including gluten grains, but still having issues with bloating, difficulty losing weight. My hair is thinning, um, thinning to concern. Um, one caveat, too much coffee. Yeah, if you, so if you have the caveat of too much coffee, coffee, uh, coffee is an, an adrenal stimulant, right? So we, again, when we talk about too much coffee, what does that mean? Because that's a relative term. You know, if you're drinking more than a cup a day, though, I would consider getting it under a cup a day to see if that that helps you any further. Because, you know, if you're already restricting your diet in that way and not feeling better, that that coffee could be playing a role. Now, beyond that, you may have other issues. Have you know, you have a lot. It sounds like you have a lot of bloating and and um, and that could be, you know, something coming into your diet that that is feeding the microbiome in an improper way. So the microbiome can also play a role in weight gain and thinning hair, et cetera. So consider having your microbiome um, looked at. You can do that uh, with a good culture type of test and, um, and get some ideas as to why it might also be happening, why your symptoms might also be continuing to go on. So I've had a kidney and an adrenal gland removed. Um, so I'm working on one only. What can I do to support my body? Removed when I was 15 due to endometriosis. I'm 53 now, but I always wondered how that has changed my body. The best thing to do, because when you have a kidney removed, you, your other one gets bigger. I mean, it, it, it can actually grow and get bigger and take on the role of the other one. That's why, you know, so many people that donate their kidneys is what we'll see happen. And so they can still function and thrive in that way. So one of the things that I would recommend that you do is obviously monitor your kidney output and function, do testing like blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, and GFR to, to look at your, to make sure your kidneys are functioning well. Also consider some adrenal testing, like measuring your diurnal cortisol rhythms which would be looking at cortisol at different times of the day, but also looking at hormones like DHEA just to get a, you know, get an, to get some feedback on how well your adrenal, your one adrenal and your one kidney are working. Because if they're working just fine, you may not have to do anything any differently. Um, and so that, that's where just having that data would help you know. I mean, you could certainly, there are certain things you could use to just supplementally support you. You know, we have um, an adrenal glandular product that it's it's um, it's called ultra adrenal support that you could use, but you may not need it. Again, it's one of those things where if you're testing low output, then no. that would be what I would I would consider. But if you're not, you know, it may not be an issue. Uh, 
Um, somebody's asking about how to get products against the yeast. I think maybe that, that was what I was mentioning. Can you put can you put a link up to those, Mel? Mm -hmm. My mom started taking diethyl propion to lose weight. She's in her early 70s. I was worried about this drug. Do you have any advice I can share with her? Yeah, you're not going to lose weight with drugs. It's not been done successfully with any medicine, um, at least not without extreme side effects and problems. So look, how do you lose weight? You exercise, you eat well. That's it. It's, it's not rocket science. Now, there's caveats to that. Certainly, there are inflammatory issues that pe different people and individuals might be having. But if your mom's goal and desire is to truly lose weight and she needs to commit to diet change, lifestyle change, taking a pill is a passive uh, is a passive thing. And it's it, at the end of the day, she's going to suffer the consequences. And any, this is true of any medicine. You, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. There's always a consequence on the outcome. So if you want to do it right, you have to do it actively. That means you have to take control and make meaningful diet and lifestyle changes and behavioral changes to be successful because no drug or pill or potion or lotion or anything else is going to lead you to long-term success with weight loss. This has been shown time and time and time again, but people fall for that trick repetitively. So, so I would say the advice I'd have for your mom is quit falling for the trick and get to work in a loving way. What's my thought on sunflower oil and upcycled sunflower protein? Why? Why would you want to use this uh, sunflower oil? What, what's the purpose? I mean, I'm not a fan of processed oils as a general rule of thumb. There are really only three oils that, that I would consider in small amounts and under certain situations and reasons, but even in a good, healthy person eating whole real food, they're just not not things that I encourage people to do. And that's olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil, or regular meat fat like uh, tallow. But um, as far as a lot of the seed and nut oils, it, you know, you those things come at a cost. They're highly reactive and oxidative. And so they're very, very prone to being rancid when you try to consume them. And so you end up potentially doing more damage than good. Um, can you please explain the cross-reactivity in the gluten-free diet? It's too deep of a conversation to answer here, but I, I'll simplify it. Cross-reactivity is where another molecule or protein looks so similar to gluten that your immune system looks at that molecule and confuses it as gluten, and so then you have a reaction to it as well. We see cross-reactivity for things like coffee. We see cross-reactivity for quinoa. We see cross-reactivity in people with Lyme disease and cross-reactivity for people with yeast overgrowth. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of potential things that create a cross-reactivity, you know, from a gluten perspective, but, but that's the, the short answer. What about RX sugar? It says grain free. I don't know what's in RX sugar. Is if that that's a brand? Give you know, tell me what the, what the specific ingredients are, and I can give you a more intelligent answer. But I don't I don't know what RX sugar is. What type of pathogenic infection can create back pain? Lots of them, but Pseudomonas aeruginosa is one very common one um, that can that can leak through the gut and stimulate or contribute to an autoimmune process that that looks sometimes looks like ankylosing spondylitis um so you know that's that's an example is magnesium oil a good way to substitute ingested magnesium there are so many kinds of magnesium not sure what kind is best i'm actually planning a show on magnesium to discuss that very topic iris and i'll do a deep dive so be patient with me and we'll bring that information to you make sure you're subscribed from gluten intolerant i found out from private gut microbiome test
or how you how you know um, that you're gluten intolerant from a microbiome test. You you can't tell that from a microbiome test. Um, you know, and in, in unless in that microbiome test, they're actually measuring for antibody responses to gluten, and yours came back positive, Sue. Um, but but if that's the case, okay. Um, how do I know if I'm dairy or lactose intolerant? I think is the question. You get tested. Lactose intolerance, you can actually do a test through your GI doctor if you, if you want to. Um, as far as dairy allergy, there's different types, but we, we offer testing that looks at all the different types or components of different dairy proteins, et cetera, that you, know, you might consider doing, Sue. It's, um, it's our delayed food sensitivity test. The other way would be to ask your doctor to do what's called an IgE test, a blood test for dairy specifically. What can I use to help me digest food since I've had my gallbladder removed? We have, Jane, we have something called LipoGest, and it's designed to support people without gallbladders to help them better digest. So check that product out and see if it's helpful for you. How do you know if you have vitamin B? I don't understand if you're, if you're deficient in vitamin B, or I, I'm just going to make the assumption that that's what you mean. Um, you get tested. You get nutrient tested. Don't do serum testing. Serum testing is inaccurate and misleading. So, um, but the type of testing that you can have done is called intracellular testing. That's what you would want to ask for. If your doctor has never heard of it or, or looks at you like you're crazy when you say that term, go to Gluten Free Society and consider using um, our nutrient test. It is an intracellular test. It measures 55 nutrients, including all of your B vitamins. What's the best blood work to diagnose celiac disease? I, you know, if you're, Joanne, if you're specifically talking about celiac disease, that the, the criteria for the diagnosis of celiac disease is that it cannot be determined strictly from blood work. Okay. So blood work is, um, what we call an adjunctive testing. So, so the criteria to diagnose celiac disease looks like this. You have to have positive blood work. So like what we call positive serology, that's where you have positive reactions, antibody reactions, either to something called transglutaminase or to, um, to gliadin or to something called, a, uh, there's a test called an anti-endomyceal antibody test. Those three, gliadin, TTG, and anti-endomyceal antibodies are the serology blood tests that can be looked at if your doctor's trying to diagnose celiac. Now, you couple positive result over there with a, what's called a positive biopsy. That's where they go in, do in an upper GI, and they take a biopsy of the small intestine, and they are looking for something called villous atrophy. And if they find that, and you also have positive antibodies, that's how they make a diagnosis of celiac disease. That's the way to confirm it. Now, I don't agree with that. That's just the standard of medical care. That's the standard. That's what all the major GI doctors are doing. That's how it's done. So if you go to a regular doctor, that's what you're going to be told. So now that you know that, what's the best way to test for gluten sensitivity? It's not an antibody test. As I mentioned earlier, you could have antibody deficiencies as a result of long-term immune suppression caused by gluten. And so depending on an antibody test to show up positive, it's a stretch because many people with gluten issues have low antibody levels and you can get a false negative on those types of blood tests. So this is where a lot of people go to their doctor, get tested. They're told you're not reacting to gluten. And then they go anyway and they try a gluten-free diet and feel better, right? And, and so you can get a false negative on, on a blood test. You can get a false negative on a biopsy, but what you won't get a false negative on is genetic testing. Genetic testing shows whether or not you have the genes that predispose you to reacting to gluten. That's why I like genetic testing. That's why that's what I use with folks. So if you, you know, genetic testing won't diagnose celiac disease though. So again, I say that because specifically your question was what tests are good to diagnose celiac disease. So genetic testing won't diagnose celiac disease, but it will tell you whether or not you have that genetic predisposition to react to gluten. And if you do, you should avoid it regardless of whether you have celiac disease. Do sensitivity tests for particular food results change six years later? Yes. 
Um, and your yes, your body can also readjust. So your body, you can become more tolerable of foods as you get healthier. Do food sensitivities change? Yes, especially in a six-year time frame. They've, they've changed about 12 times. Not a, so um, your immune system is brand new about every six months or so. So they will change that frequently. What's good for low blood pressure? You need to check out our crash course on blood pressure, Pepita. Um, check that out. We'll put a link up for you and you can watch that video. It's super in-depth on blood pressure. Uh, let's see. Another, another question I think coming through on how to purchase detox products and thyroid products. Can you put some links up for Sue for us? What do you recommend for osteoporosis? So far, 10 vertebra, vertebra have fractured. Uh, nine have kyphoplasty. The other um, question is whether Cushing syndrome can be cured. It, Cushing's can certainly be aided. I've seen a number of cases of Cushing's do really, really well with grain-free diets. It's an autoimmune Cushing, for those of you that don't know, it's an autoimmune disease of the adrenal glands. And um, we all know, or you should all know if you're watching me for any length of time, that gluten is the most well-studied and most well-identified cause of autoimmune disease. So if you're not already gluten-free, grain-free, Simi, you need to be, uh, you need to look into it or get tested for it. Um, as far as what you can do with those, with that fracturing, you're probably gluten sensitive and it's causing the osteoporosis. Again, it's rare to have that many vertebral fractures so aggressively. So as far as nutrition support, we have something called a bone box, which is just going to help support your body with the nutrients necessary for bone health. But you really need to look into why the autoimmune disease is there. And that, you know, again, with Cushing's, we know you have autoimmunity. Osteoporosis, we know you have autoimmunity. So what are the triggers of autoimmunity? Food, chemicals, microbial imbalance, and nutritional deficiencies. So, you know, you need to work with a functional practitioner to have those things looked at, measured, so that you can assess what changes you need to make to your diet and lifestyle to get better. I'm learning so much from this channel and your book. I have nearly cured my ulcerative colitis. Is rice flour safe and can it be used for bread? No. Rice is a no-go. Um check out my videos on rice and why it's a no-go. There are several reasons why. Rice technically has a form of gluten in it called orzanin that can cause inflammation for many people, uh, especially if you have ulcerative colitis. There's, there's a, rice is one of the more common proteins that causes something called FPIs, food protein-induced enterocolitis. So you may, that, that rice, if you're using that rice, bread or that rice flour, that may be kind of the missing link for you, Christian. So check that out. I'm trying an elimination diet and haven't had gluten for four weeks. How long to see if it's better? You mentioned four months. Are onions and goulash a problem? So onions generally are fine unless you're reactive to them. I mean, you could be reactive to them and um, and so again, without, I wouldn't know that without you actually having some uh, appropriate testing done, but, um, you know, four months is a good time frame to give a gluten grain free diet in terms of, you know, getting past the inflammatory cycle and getting the gluten out of your system. What are your thoughts on biohormone replacement to increase estrogen? Um, I think it depends on the person. A lot of women do really well with biohormone replacement and need to do it. Many women have had hysterectomies or, um, you know, have had, you know, whether it's partial or whether it's full. Um, and, you know, that hormone replacement therapy can really radically change and improve the quality of their life as a result of, you know, post-surgical removal of the organ. And then some women just do really well on it as a whole uh, for whatever various a sundry of different reasons. And, and so, um, I think if you're going to use it, it needs to be monitored. I think you need to work with a doctor who's really good at monitoring it. Um, and you should know that, you know, estrogen therapy, medicine, estrogen therapies have a, uh, and it, they increase the risk for causing B6 deficiencies, magnesium deficiency, vitamin B2 deficiency, and vitamin B3 deficiency. So there are some 
nutrient deficit relationships with estrogen, you know, if you need the estrogen, it don't let that be a deterrent, but you need to know that so that you can have your nutrient levels checked as long as you're using estrogen therapy. Do you recommend yeast shield for somebody on a long-term low dose of antibiotics? I mean, if you're on low doses of antibiotics, it's a good idea to do something preventatively for yeast. And so that's not a bad idea, Mary. The bigger question is, why are you on low dose long-term antibiotics? Um, you know, is that, you know, is that necessary or, or is that something that somebody's having you try? Um, again, I don't know. I'm just speculating out loud with you. Will explanting breast implants help to cure autoimmune disease? It will if the breast implants are driving, um, are one of the chemical triggers for it. I've seen cases where breast implants were part of it. And I've also seen women who had breast implants where their autoimmune disease was fine without having an explant surgery. So it depends on the person. If you haven't changed your diet and your lifestyle first, I don't recommend surgical removal of anything until you've done diet and lifestyle first. And, and so that sh should be kind of a first starting point. And then you can go on to look at, um, at explant potential possibilities, you know, if you need to. What can you tell me about carrageenan? It's in a med I take. Carrageenan causes gastrointestinal inflammation. That's what I can tell you about it. Um, we have an article on this, Linda. It's called Toxic Gums. I think it's on Gluten Free Society's website. We did actually an article, an interview um, on that very topic with some um, content around carrageenan, Linda, if you want to check that out. What's a good lab to do for a good thorough food sensitivity test? Um, can we put that up to Mel for Nada on Facebook? She's asking what lab to do for food sensitivities. Do you recommend any shampoo, conditioner, ACV, and rosemary made uh, my hair oily? Look, shampoo and conditioner is such a unique thing for the person because some people are heavy oil, some people are light oil. Um, there's a lot of different ingredients to parse through when it comes to different shampoo and conditioner products. Uh, and I've seen people react. I, as a matter of fact, I have a, a close family member who reacts to benzoic acid, which is a common preservative found in a lot of shampoos. And so that would always cause her skin around her face to break out. I, it's one of those things. I'm not going to make a recommendation one because companies change their ingredients so rapidly. And, um, it's just such a unique thing. That's why we don't, we don't, we haven't really offered any type of shampoo or conditioner at this point because the, it's just such a unique thing. You've really got to ideally, if they, if you're having a problem, get sensitivity tested for chemical ingredients that can be found or used in shampoos and then pick accordingly the best way you can. Can gluten sensitivity come from Roundup? No. Um, Roundup poisoning can happen if you get exposed to Roundup, but gluten sensitivity is gluten sensitivity. And so it's a good question because I think a lot of people are confused. They think that, you know, the, the, the influx of people going on gluten-free diets has got more to do with Roundup than it does gluten. And I would say we, there is definitely a percentage of people who do better not eating grain because they're not being exposed to Roundup. Uh, in as aggressive of a fashion, but it's not the only, that's not the only exposure that a person gets to Roundup. There are a lot of foods that are Roundup ready. There are a lot of products that are Roundup ready that are, um, that are detrimental and beyond the grains. And so, um, if you're gluten sensitive, you can be gluten sensitive without, and, and let me just say it like this, gluten sensitivity is genetic. So you either have the genes or you don't. Now, Roundup is a poison. It will damage your gut, and it will accelerate reactions to gluten in a much heightened and, and more aggressive way. But it is not the cause of gluten sensitivity. I don't, I don't know if I answered that question. But both are problems. But Roundup affects everyone who, who refuses to eat organically. Gluten is going to affect people predominantly who are gluten sensitive and don't know it. How long do you need to be in a moldy environment before you're growing it in your body? Can mold toxins be only in your body if you left the moldy environment? So 
You've got to be in, in well, it depends on the molding environment, Brenda, because and it depends on you. So th there's a lot of variable there because if you're, if you're a person with already a compromised immune system and you find yourself in a moldy environment, I mean, it, you could, you could have a problem in as little as a few days. Um, it doesn't necessarily take months or years being in moldy environment to, to have health detriment. Um, but part of that depends on how long you're in it, how much mold is in the environment that, you know, that you're being exposed to because it's a dose issue, right? And if you have a minor mold problem, it might not be as bad as if you have a major mold problem. In my house, when we had our problem, I mean, we had one of the biggest mold problems I've ever seen clinically. We had, you know, hundreds of thousands of spore counts of mold growing and pushing through our wall cavities. And so, you know, that anything higher than a thousand on a typical test is considered high. We were in the hundreds of thousands. So that's a lot of mold. It doesn't take long to get sick in an environment like that. But let's say your problem was you only had 10,000 mold spores you know, in, in your environment that you're being exposed to. Maybe it takes a little bit longer because the dose is not as high. Again, there's a lot of caveat to answering that question. As far as can mold toxins be only in your body if you left the mold? So you're asking me, if you get out of mold, can you still have mold toxins in your body? Yes, there's a time frame by which your body's going to get rid of those mold toxins, though, and it shouldn't take five years. Like, you shouldn't have mycotoxin, high mycotoxin levels in your body if you're years removed, you know, from mold, you know, if you're, if you're five years out, it, you know, that's not something that we, we would typically see somebody still be, be high end. Now it can take that long. It can take a few years to get that stuff out of you, but you also have to understand you can also get exposure in your day-to-day -day life. You may go to your grocery store and they have a mold problem, or you may, you know, go to a hotel on a vacation and they may have a mold problem, right? So there are all these other potential ways that a person could get mold exposure that you also want to be aware of in order for me to answer this question, you know, properly. And then there's also how well your body is detoxing. And so, you know, one of the things that mold can do is damage your liver and therefore damage your ability to excrete the mycotoxins. And so that's also a caveat that plays into this as well. So there's just a lot of variable things. Be patient. I'm actually, we're working on a pretty comprehensive documentary around mold, the most comprehensive documentary that you'll ever see on the topic where we're, um, Oh, we're, we're probably close to 30 hours into filming right now, but that should, I'm hoping that'll come out uh, sometime, you know, around December, January of, of the following year. So more answers to come from mold. What can I use to help with blood sugar? Um, lots of things. Watch my crash course on blood sugar. Consider chromium, consider vanadium, consider magnesium, consider B vitamins, consider exercise, consider diet change. Because those are all the things that, you know, that you're going to want to use, not just pills, but behaviors. How long should you use medication for fungus? Doctor said four weeks. Fluconazole is that not too long? Look, follow your doctor's instruction on this. It's hard for me to answer that question because I don't know anything about you, and it would be irresponsible for me to to try to argue or or counterpoint your doctor. Um, you know, so that's a better question asked to your prescribing doctor. I'm grain free and have heel pain and can't hardly and can't can hardly walk. I'm celiac osteoporosis, AS, and all the osteos. Where's the question? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not seeing a question in that. Um, all that's recoverable. I'll just say that all of those things are recoverable. Um, if you're doing the right things, if you're not doing the right things and you're, str and you're struggling, you need to get appropriate testing done. I have psoriatic arthritis. My arthritis has affected my right fingers as well as my ankles from swelling up. Where's the question here? Clarence, give me a question. I I, I, I can only read your comment, but I, I think you have a question, but it, it just doesn't, it's not clear to me. Let's see here. Do you recommend, let's see, I answered that. Is this a bad energy in my stomach hurts and I have diarrhea after eating eggs and meat instead of smoothie. My body craves fruits. Is that normal when changing the diet? 
Can be, it depends. And I mean, there's a lot to unpack there because I don't know enough about you beyond that paragraph um, that you've written for me. There, there are a lot of, of things that could be going on there that you, you know, if you're, if you're trying to change your diet, Again, that's, that's something else I'm not sure. Of. I, I'm just not sure you didn't give me enough information. Um, is LPS a topic too specific for you to have a show on? Probably most people would go way above their heads. That's no offense to any of our intelligent listeners. That's just, you know, it's one of those in-depth type of topics that um, it probably would lose most of the audience in the, in the discussion. But um, I don't know if that answers your question. What can you tell me about alpha gal um what would you like me to tell you it's you know it's generally it's a situation where someone's been tick bitten and they start reacting to meat and um, can you overcome that yes um, but you've got to get the tick the, the lyme based disease under control and you've got to get the gut sealed and healed to be able to start tolerating meat again so i don't know if that's helpful for you but that's kind of the 20 second overview of it Is it common to tolerate corn, rice, and oat just be sensitive to wheat? No, not typically. Um, is it possible? You know, it is possible, but um, my experience working with people, very rarely do we see them just be allergic to wheat and tolerate the other grains well. Typically, um, they, may, they may feel better going wheat-free, but they still are having inflammatory problems from the other grains, and they may not be as aggressive of inflammatory problems as wheat is, but they're still problematic, and they're still... People that are doing it are still struggling. Again, that's my experience. Is chronic sinusitis and rhinitis caused by gluten? It can be. There are lots of things that can cause chronic sinusitis. Um, I mean, mold, environmental mold can do it. Gluten certainly can do it. Other food allergies can do it. An infection in your sinus cavities can also do it. I mean, there's just a litany of different things. Is vitamin K2 good for arthrosis or arthritis? I, I'm, I'm, assuming that's what you mean, um, can be if you're low in vitamin K2. Now, if you're not low in vitamin K2, you have arthritis, taking more vitamin K2 might not be helping your arthritis much, but um, it's possible that it can be helpful. Can you have a leaky gut with a normal zonulin level? Yes, absolutely. Zonulin is no, by no means a definitive test for leaky gut. Now, if you, if you have a high zonulin problem, yes, you do have a leaky gut, but if you have a normal zonulin, it doesn't mean you don't have a leaky gut. It's not a definitive test. Okay, let's go down. In the middle there. I don't know what to do. Hashimoto's for two years, not getting better, taking 50 milligrams of Levo. You need to see somebody um, because if you're not getting better after two years and you're not doing the right thing, um, you know, again, with Hashimoto's, it's an autoimmune antibody disease against the thyroid. No amount of levothyroxine is going to fix the fact that you're having an autoimmune reaction against your thyroid. Drugs don't solve autoimmune disease. They suppress the symptoms. In some cases, they don't even do that. You've got to figure out why your immune system is, is, is attacking and that you know, when you figure that piece out, you get rid of that equation, then, then you'll start feeling better. Chronic UTI, spinal cord injury, the kidney stone center has me in the low dose antibiotic to keep the infections at base. So I'm going to assume that if you're at a kidney stone center, that you have a history of kidney stones, Mary Ellen, and that you should probably look into oxalate um, low oxalate a little bit more aggressively if you haven't, um, because that, you know, that can oxalate can mimic a chronic UTI 
um, they can mimic it and they can contribute to it. So if you haven't looked at that, I certainly would encourage you to. I love this comment. I cured my graves by stopping gluten. I saved my thyroid gland. Thank you, Kaylee, for sharing your story. Functional medicine doctors' fees are not in my insurance coverage. As an Army veteran, they don't provide functional medicine. I have an appointment with a new neurosurgeon. I hate to hear that. Um, you know, it, I wish I wish insurance would cover it, but um, the sad reality is it doesn't, especially for our veterans. Um, yeah, I feel for you. I did a food sensitivity test and gluten was fine, but I'd like to stop it anyway, um, as I have thyroid problems. Well, if you did a food sensitivity test, I can promise you that those are not accurate for, for picking up on gluten. So if it was, if it was fine, most likely it was a false negative if you're struggling with an autoimmune condition or a thyroid problem, but I would not rely on a food sensitivity test to assess gluten sensitivity. Gluten sensitive, 10 year old, intestines are inflamed, no gluten, no dairy, no eggs, no corn, no potatoes, et cetera, basically on meat and veggies, still sick with stomach pain, what to do. You gotta get that, that youngster tested because there may be an infection in the GI tract. There may be a microbial overgrowth. If he's still struggling with pain, you might also look at mold in your environment. One of the most common symptoms I see in children um, who are living in a moldy home is stomach pain and no amount of diet change fixes that. So um, you might look at that as well. How is it that we should do the mold provocation before doing mold testing for toxins in the body? I don't understand the question. Um, if you're going to test for mold toxins in your body, you, you know, the best way to do that is urine testing. You can do to provoke, you know, some people um, need to provoke before doing a urine test like that. So taking, you know, for about three to five days, taking anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of glutathione combined with NAC and acetylcysteine, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams um, is, a, is a good way to help provoke mycotoxins into the urine for, a, for preparation of a test like that. Do lentils contain any form of gluten? No, they don't contain gluten, but they do contain proteins and lectins and things that are really hard to digest. And so some people initially going gluten-free struggle with lentils as well. Um, we have an article on lentils that you might want to check out and get more in-depth information from. What's the non-flushing type of niacin? And does it help lower lipids and raise HDL? No, not anywhere near as well, Kim. Um, but it's called, it's, it's niacinamide is the name of the type of niacin that doesn't cause the flush. How do you determine what causes a stomach ulcer? Um, have your doctor check you for H. pylori. Have your doctor do a culture. Um, those, are, those are two great ways to detect and then also get tested for food allergies and food sensitivities because a lot of ulcers are not caused by microbes. They're caused by foods that you're eating. Um, a lot of them are also caused by drugs. So, you know, make sure you do an assessment of any medications that you're on. Certain medications cause ulceration in the stomach. S simple class of drugs called NSAIDs, non steroidal anti inflammatories, are notorious for creating stomach ulcers. So, we, do we put a, a link up for food sensitivity testing in that feed? Okay. So, Laurie, we put a link up for you already on the food sensitivity testing. Can I use probiotic with Espilardi long term? Generally, you can, yes. Um, I have celiac and I'm always feeling sick. Also, have 
congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease, all gluten-free food, but still feel sick. What can this be? Raquel, are you gluten-free or are you grain-free? Are you, are you traditionally gluten-free? Have you followed no grain, no pain? Have you read no grain, no pain? Um, because the classic mistake of the celiac community is that they go wheat, barley, and rye free, and then they go to the gluten-free food aisle and buy all that garbage processed corn, rice, and oatmeal nonsense, and they stay sick as a result of doing those things. So I would encourage you to look at those other grains if you're still consuming them as part of the reason why you're not doing well. Okay. My stomach's growling. That, that means we're already past time. It's 1.55. We're going to wrap it. Look, thanks so much for tuning in to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. I'll be back next Thursday at 12.30 Central Standard Time. So if you want to come back, if I didn't answer your question today, you want to come back and ask your question. We're here every week. We're here for you. We love you. We want to take care of you. We want to help you. So do me a favor. If you like these shows and if you want to support us, you can do that in a couple of different ways. Number one, you can help us reach our mission. Our mission is to help save 100 million lives, and we can do that when we take this information and we disseminate it and share it with as many people as we think will be helped by it as possible. So don't be stingy. Get the word out. Share this information with people that you care about. Number two, come visit us at Gluten-Free Society. If you're looking for certified gluten-free products, if you're looking for high-quality nutritional support supplements to add to your repertoire regimen, consider supporting us and our staff of 11 folks that make this show possible for you every week. Number three, sign up for our free newsletter. Our newsletter is um, it's rich with information. You'll get tons of info on diet, on recipes, on how to navigate autoimmunity, on testing, You'll also get reminders when we do shows, when we do special shows, et cetera. So come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org and sign up there. Again, it won't cost you anything. So support me in any way that you can so that we can continue this mission to the best of our ability. I appreciate all of you. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you on Tuesday for a crash course in the Dr. Osborne's